Uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to go ahead and open to James, James chapter 1. That's where we'll be uh, studying from this evening, continuing our study in the book of James. We have several visitors with us. We're certainly thankful for your presence. Uh, some that have been out sick amongst this number, number uh, and, and happy to see you back uh, with us as well. We've already talked about uh, in some of our lessons, the, the first two lessons in the study of James, uh, we've observed how we are to endure trials, just generally trials, how we endure those things. And the first thing to notice there is that trials still come as a result of being disciples of Christ. Uh, one might expect when we become Christians, when we become a disciple of Christ, that all of our problems go away. We address some of those things. That doesn't happen. We just we deal with them uh, in a different way now. We reframe the trials. And so what are we to do with them? We are to take joy in our trials because of uh, what those trials are to produce in Christ. Uh, they produce patience or endurance. They are to produce uh, perfection, completeness in Christ. And in the midst of all of that, what are we to do? We are to ask for wisdom, uh, asking for wisdom uh, in terms of how we are to deal with the trials. So certainly, uh, as we continue to look at this wisdom, this is our main source of wisdom, isn't it? This is what we are to look to. And we observe that God also gives abundantly. He is a father and we'll look at that aspect of him being a father this evening as well. But he wants to give. He wants to give good gifts. He gives abundantly and without reproach. And then we finally looked at uh, boasting. Boasting in the right sort of things. The, uh, the humble in their exaltation, but the rich in their humiliation. We can, we can find good things in the midst of trials, no matter what station in life we may find ourselves in. And then I want to uh, touch upon the last verse that we looked at last time, which is verse 12, which is this idea of looking to a reward. Uh, and I hope that's maybe too small. I wanted to try to get it all on one slide. Um, but again, if you do have a Bible, follow along with the reading here. We're going to pick up in James chapter 1 in verse 12 and read through uh, verse 18. Blessed is the man who endures temptation... For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So we already noticed last time, but again I want to look at this. Disciples are to look to the reward. Not just a reward, but the reward. That word for temptation we noted last time can also be translated trial. It may be translated that way uh, in uh, the, the Bible that you're reading from. Mine, it translates in the New King James, uh, temptation. So we noted that James is beginning to use some word play here. This is kind of a hinge verse where he's been talking about uh, trials just generally, where a trial can be a temptation, a temptation can be a trial, but now he's... He's kind of moving into this specific section of talking about temptations properly. Uh, and so, with that, uh, we might say even, uh, he who perseveres or he who endures under trials and temptations. So it's generic, but uh, this is a quote from Barnes, uh, from, from his, one of his commentaries on James. Uh, affliction, persecution, sickness, etc. may be regarded as, in a certain sense, temptations to sin. 
That is, the question comes before us whether we will adhere to the religion on account of which we are persecuted or apostatize from it and escape these sufferings. Whether in sickness and losses we will be patient and submissive to that God who lays his hand upon us or revolt and murmur. And then he goes on, in these respects, in a general sense, all forms of trial may be regarded as temptation. And that's, I believe, the sense of what James is trying to get across. Again, temptations could be trials, trials could be temptations. And as he uses that idea of a trial, the same root word, the the, uh, verb form of that word, we're going to find in verse 13, which we'll get to here in just a moment. But... It says there, let no one when he is tried, let let no one when he is tempted, that he is tempted by God. So verse 12 is, is again, this type of transition as we move forward here. So we notice that the end of our trials ends with a reward. Matthew 12 and verse 13, again, learning from the master teacher, teacher, he who endures to the end will be saved. I would also note, in kind of the beginning of this uh, specific discussion on temptation, James begins with the reward. He doesn't end the conversation in talking about the reward. He starts with it. And I think that's very telling, uh, especially considering what we're going to continue to be talking about. And again, this is a sure, this is a steadfast hope. And so we are not a people that are... Uh, just aimlessly wandering around throughout this life with no real goal, with no real purpose in mind. We're marching towards something. We're working towards something. We have that eternal goal. We have that goal to be made in Christ's image here so that we can be in Christ's image beyond this life. That is what we're working towards. And by the way, That is what uh, God wants for us as well. That's God's goal for us. He does not want us to fail. He wants us to have the victory. He wants us to win. And he's told us, I've already won. I've already gained the victory. Christ has overcome death. And you too can overcome. We talked about some of those things last time. But I would note here, and we'll continue to flesh this out, God is not the only one working with the trials. Satan is on the other end of that. And he's wanting to turn that into a temptation. And he's wanting us to fail, isn't he? He's wanting us uh, to, to falter and to slip and to lead towards utter destruction. Of course, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 talks about him there. The devil is a, uh, like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But again, what is God's goal? God's goal is... You notice how the verse starts there again, blessed. Blessed is the man. That's the same word that is used several times in Matthew chapter 5 in what we call the Beatitudes, the same word that Jesus uses there. So <clears throat> this, may be, this may be part of the main contrast in a trial versus a temptation, or maybe not versus, that maybe that's not the right word, but between a trial and temptation. Again, Satan is trying to use the trial to get us to slip. God is telling us that we can become better through the trial. We are to take joy in it. We're to grow in patience. We're to grow uh, in perfection and, and eventually leading to this crown that he talks about in verse 12, this crown of life. We are to overcome And I believe this is exactly why God is long-suffering. Isn't that what Peter says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9? He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Because he knows and he wants all to overcome, as many as would come to him. And only God knows the perfect time when that's going to happen. Uh, We certainly do not, but we trust that he knows what is best, But I'll tell you what we better be sure of. We had better be sure that we're using our time, using the gift of time that God has given us to 
work every day to overcome those trials and to overcome those temptations that might come before us. He wants us to repent. He wants us to overcome. Uh, Again, we overcome so that we may be blessed. We noted last time uh, that word for crown is maybe a word that uh, we've studied before, Stephanos, which is that crown of victory that uh, the victor is given after the, uh, the games in the old days of the, the Olympic games. Brother West talked about that uh, in the study in 1 Corinthians, so I'm not going to tread on his uh, material too much. But it's the idea that this crown is given to the victor. It's not given to second place. There's no participant trophy. It's to the victor. It's to the one who overcomes. So we think about this in terms of an athlete. An athlete who is serious about what he's doing is not going to be eating ice cream and hot pockets for all of his meals. He's going to be disciplined. And we talked about that in terms of what a disciple is. A disciple is very much associated with discipline. It's in the name, isn't it? As some would suggest, even... Uh, there are not there are not these various levels of heaven and hell where if you do so much then you'll you'll find yourself in this layer of heaven if you don't do quite as much as you need to but you're still kind of a good person you'll find yourself in not the worst part of hell uh, but you know you're kind of in the middle here whatever it might be there's two options there's victory And there's defeat. And we have to decide right now in this life which one we're after. Because we are going to choose, and we do get to choose. God has given us that choice. As Hebrews uh, talks about, we are to leave behind those things that easily ensnare us and the sin uh, which which gets us to slip. We We don't want those things in our life anymore. We want to attain the victory. And so we have to become disciplined. Now, I would note finally here, uh, what is behind all of this? The very last phrase that he says there, uh, to those who love him. The love of the Lord is one of the main motivators behind all of this. This crown belongs to those that love the Lord. We endure the trials because we love the Lord. And we seek to overcome temptations because we love the Lord. Again, I refer us to the master teacher, as James, I think, does here. John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how this is worked out. And this is what overcoming the trials and overcoming the temptations look like. And so a lack of love, a lack of love for God, of of who God truly is, might lead us to misunderstand who God is. I'll say that again. A lack of love for God might lead us to misunderstand who God is and to misunderstand what's actually happening amidst the temptations. So, James moves into this section here. In verse 13 there, we are not to blame God. He gets that out of the way. We do not blame God for these temptations. As he's already been talking about, he's been talking about trials, so someone might come to the conclusion, well, God must be the one who is tempting me. Uh, Why is he doing this? This really does come down to an understanding of who God truly is, his true character, not something that we conjure up, not something that uh, we hear someone say or, or we think might be true, but what is true? I would note, we noted this last time with some of the language that James lays out for us here, this is again a command and not just a suggestion. He says, let no one. So just as we are uh, to ask for wisdom from God or glory in humiliation or exaltation, we are not to blame God. As we're faced with temptations, another temptation might be to blame God. Uh, why did you allow this to happen? Why are you tempting me, even? God has allowed the devil 
to work in this world. He's allowed those temptations to come against us. But He's not left us alone in the fight. We need to make no mistake about that. He's given us the tools to overcome those things. Uh, Again, talking about the blame game, isn't that exactly, that's going all the way back to the beginning, or nearly the very beginning, isn't it? It's this woman that you gave me. It's it's the serpent. He's He's the one that made me do it. When we're not looking at ourselves. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But coming back to uh, God, not leaving this just up to ourselves, we, know, we mentioned this last time, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, that God is not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but will every time, 100%, provide the way of escape. Every time. Now, <clears throat> we can also see from the language of this passage that we will be tempted. It's going to happen to each and every single one of us. If it's not happened, it will. And so what are you going to do? How are you going to handle it? Again, I would reference us back to uh, verse 5. We're to use wisdom, aren't we? We use that wisdom. But we do not. what we do not do is start with the premise of, why did God tempt me? We don't even start there. And we don't start there because it's impossible. It's contradictory. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. So if one place he says God cannot tempt, but yet he's tempting, well, that's a contradictory or a contradictory statement. That's a lie. Can't be true. 1 John chapter 1. I won't read all of that passage there. You know it well, I'm sure. 1 John 1, really 5 through 10. God is light. This is who He is. This is His very nature. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And if we practice sin and we say that we're in the light, we are lying. So we are to walk in the light as He is in the light. And again, I would say, God wants us to win. He does not want us to fail. And I believe... I believe that may be the very reason that James starts with the promise in this discussion here. God wants us to have this crown. James makes that clear. He he cements that in our minds. God wants us to win the victory. And then he leads into this discussion of saying, it's not even on the table that God tempts us because this is true. This is true. Well... Someone's got to be to blame if this happens. It's not God. Who is it? Well, I would say we need to be exactly like how David presents himself or or talks about sin. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13, when Nathan the prophet confronts him about his sin and it's revealed to him that he's the bad guy of this story that he's been told... David realizes the weight of his sin, and he says, I have sinned against the Lord. And we go over to Psalm 51, in that that beautiful psalm where David just pours out his heart to the Lord in true confession and true repentance. And he says, against you and you only have I sinned. He takes responsibility for what he's done. Now... Maybe someone's temptation might be to say, God, let this happen. Maybe they even take it a step further and say, Satan made me do it. I think maybe the the more uh, correct way of saying that or framing it would be, when I am tempted, I am to say, I did this. I made this choice to go further beyond that temptation. I have sinned. Now, Satan is the one that is using my desires and my my lusts, and he's enticing me. We'll continue to talk about that. But we bear the load. We bear the responsibility for what we do. And in many ways, this is a heart issue. Over in Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6 and in verse 45 says there, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, 
And the evil person put out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. A lot talked about the heart here. Whatever is inside of you in your deepest, innermost person is what's going to come out of you. In Matthew chapter 5, we looked at this recently in, in our auditorium class again, in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, but I say to you, he talks about uh, anger against a brother. He talks about uh, whoever lusts in their heart, that discussion. And then even earlier in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart. This is how, uh, we might say, this is how you overcome those things, to be pure in heart. So it is each individual person who is tempted by their own desires, by their own lusts, and they, are, they, they have the potential to be drawn away from God with their own desires. And it's different for everyone. We talked about this in terms of just trials generally, various trials, a variety of them. And maybe they're similar. Uh, maybe they're similar between... Uh, one person to another, but none of them are exactly the same in, in the way that uh, we deal with those things. And I would notice just looking at the language, it says in verse 14, when he is drawn away by his own desires, there's some ownership here. It's our own. It's our own desires. It's our own lusts. This is what we are to take responsibility for. And when we sin, when we uh, when we go beyond that temptation, and I would note here, I don't think I've said this, temptation is, uh, is not a sin. Uh, it, by very definition, it's not. If we were to say that, our Lord would have, would have sinned, wouldn't he? He was tempted in the desert by Satan. It's not what we're talking about. But again with Satan, Satan is the one who's behind all of this. He's the one who's wanting us to slip, who's wanting us to fail. He's the great tempter. He's, uh, as Revelation 12 says, the deceiver of the whole world, that great dragon that's talked about there. But he uses our desire to tempt us. I want to camp out here for just a moment. Going back, I referenced Genesis chapter 3. I want to note this. Uh, <clears throat> we find all three categories from 1 John, uh, in 1 John chapter 2, back in Genesis 3. So I want to read 1 John chapter 2 and verse 5 first. 1 John 2 and verse 5. There is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And all of those things that are talked about there, what, how, how does he frame them up? These are from the world. These are not from the Father. These are of the world. Okay. Then we come back to Genesis 3. She saw that it was good for food, lust of the flesh. It was a delight to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and the desire to make one wise, the pride of life. All of those things in the first sin. And all of those things, I think we could note this, all of those things that she saw where it was, it was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and there was the desire to make one wise, all of those things can be achieved in a good way, in a moral and right way. Uh, whether it's to eat good food, there were other trees in the garden, weren't there? There were other sources of nutrition that she could have taken, but she chose the one wrong choice, the only choice uh, that she had been forbidden to eat from. We can take delight in certain things that look good and that are good morally. We understand that. And even being like God. As children of God, we're made in His image, just as His, as his creation. We should, want, we should have a desire to be like Him. But again, Eve and Adam achieved all of those things in the wrong way, in the only way that they were not supposed to. And Satan was using those desires against them, as he does today. Uh, in, in some material that I also came across, I thought this was a good demonstration of this. In Joshua chapter 7 uh, and in verse 20, I don't know if I put it up on the chart here. I don't think I did. Uh, Joshua 7 and verse 20, this of course is 
after God had already said with the spoils from Jericho, you're not to take from any of the spoils, that belongs to me. And then what does Achan do? In John, or Joshua 7, 20, uh, Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw, he was enticed, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted, I lusted after them, and then I took them. He acted on that enticement, on that temptation. He sinned. And then we know the rest of the story. That story ends in death. So from the very beginning where there was, a, uh, there was an enticing, there was a desire, there was a temptation, there was a sin, which eventually led to physical death. And James is going to use that analogy uh, to, in, in uh, further ways to talk about what sin can lead to, or what uh, desire can lead to. So with that, uh, James has already been using, even at the very beginning of the chapter, or the very beginning of the book, rather, a lot of uh, word pictures, not parables per se. I don't think we can quite call them parables, but word pictures. Whether it's uh, someone who's being tossed and driven by the winds of the sea, uh, whether it's... Uh, a flower being scorched in the heat, even that, uh, that imagery of one who is double-minded, which literally means of two minds. We can conjure up images uh, in our head of what that would look like. Now James uses some imagery to personify things about uh, desire and enticement. And he uses, in many ways, this image of an adulteress. He uses words, this is from the ESV, lure and entice. So like a fish that is being, uh, or that is swimming through the water, and they see that bait come in. They're, they're on a certain path, but as soon as they see that bait, it's enticing, and they go after it. And they latch on to the bait, and that's all she wrote. In many ways, James is using a lot of imagery here, I would say, from uh, the Proverbs. We're actually going to be looking at some of these verses uh, in the teen class this evening. But in Proverbs chapter 2, uh, I'm going to be using a few different translations here. This is Proverbs chapter 2, and in verse 16, again, this is the ESV. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman from the adulteress with her smooth words. So that's that idea of enticement, of enticing. Uh, a few chapters over in Proverbs 6 and verse 24, again in the ESV, to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. This is a woman who is seeking to trap us like a trapper, like a hunter, laying traps, laying bait so that she might capture us. Over in Proverbs uh, chapter 7 and in verse 21, uh, and I didn't write all of these down, so I brought, this is from the, the LSB, uh, Proverbs 7 and in verse 21 uh, says there, with her abundant persuasions, an abundance of persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she drives him to herself. So again, it's that idea of, it's, it's like this aroma where it just, you, you imagine the cartoons where someone's floating up off the ground when they smell a pie or that sort of thing. It's just drawing that person in. Over in verse 25, of the same chapter, Proverbs 7 and in verse 25. Do not let your heart go astray into her ways. Do not wander into her pathways. For many are the slain whom she has cast down, and numerous are all those killed by her. And then notice this last verse. The ways to Sheol are in her house, descending to the chambers of death. 
this is not this is not uh, the type of woman, and even this is I don't think this is a literal woman that's being talked about here. It could be uh, if we tie it to a specific example. But again, this idea of being drawn away by lusts and, and desires, it leads to death. I'm reminded of, in the book of Judges, we have Samson and Delilah there, uh, and she was Delilah day after day. Uh, it said that she was, I forget the exact language, but it was, it was annoying to Samson. It became an annoyance to him because she was so persistent in, in trying to, to just pull this out of him, this secret as to how he gets his strength. And it, it uses the language there of enticing daily. She was using smooth words. So <clears throat> with all of that, it's one thing to be presented with a harlot or this adulteress. We can turn them away. We can turn away desire. We can turn away temptation. Again, we've noted temptation's going to come. It's not that it won't ever come, but how do we handle with it? Or how do we, how do we handle it? It comes. We can turn it away. But what happens when we take the bait? What happens when we lie down with lust? James says here, it gives birth to a child. It gives birth to sin. And what happens if we continue to nourish that child, if we continue to feed that child? James further says, it will lead to death. As the Proverbs said, or as Proverbs 7 says, to the chambers of death. So just as Adam and Eve learned that lesson so long ago, sin leads to the exact same place as it does, or as it did then, as it does now. And may we never, may we never even treat temptation in the way of, I would never be tempted by that. I would never go down that route. We are not even to flirt with it. We're not even to get close to it. As Paul says, flee from it. Flee youthful lusts. And doesn't that conjure up an image of, of Joseph with Potiphar's wife where he's presented with that opportunity where Potiphar says, you lie with me, and he runs. He says, no, I'm out of here. Not going to happen. It's how, we're to treat, it's how we're to treat these things. Satan wants you to die. He wants you to die spiritually. That's the battle he's after. Everybody's going to die physically. But he wants you to die spiritually. He wants to drag you down to the depths of hell with him. And he'll do anything he can to do it. Romans 6 and verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. But God, again, wants us to live. The rest of that verse, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, we have these strong desires, we have these lusts, we have these temptations. How do we overcome well, we are expected to as disciples. So James has already been laying out, this is how you are not to think about God. Here's how you ought to think about temptation, about lust, about sin, and about death. And now he's about to tell us, this is how you ought to be thinking about God. This is how he actually is. This is who he truly is. So first, he says, do not be deceived. This is literally the, the idea of a wandering from the path, a, a straying from uh, the right course. So someone who's, uh, again, taken that bait, they've, they've wandered off the path. And I forget uh, where I came across this, and I don't have any reason to believe it's, it's not true. I didn't uh, think to fact check this, but uh, the, the author said more than 2,500 times there are warnings to Christians about the dangers of apostasy. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that it's at least a very large volume. Uh, here is maybe one of those areas, but I think maybe it's even a little more specific, and we'll talk about those things. But <clears throat> James has already, he's already told us, 
let no one say. Now he's giving us a warning, and he's appealing to the love that he has for uh, these brethren, this spiritual family. That's what he says there. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And he offers this as something to be wary of. This is a warning that we are to take on each and every single day. A continual guard that we must have against this. This could be uh, a guard against others that teach apostasy, that teach these specific things that James has been talking about, about being uh, tempted by God. And again, I would offer, if we have a misunderstanding about God, we have a misunderstanding about a few things, we certainly are going to have a misunderstanding about what sin is, aren't we? If we misunderstand who God is, we're certainly going to misunderstand what sin is. We also have to guard against our own thoughts. Do not deceive yourselves, one translation says. Do not deceive yourselves. This is not only a guard against saying God tempts, but also a guard against who would ever think this? Who would ever ever in their wildest dreams think that God tempts? I certainly would never. I would never go. I would never go that far. I would hope so, but may may we not be so arrogant as to say, I would never. Pride comes before the fall. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, backing up just a verse from that verse we mentioned earlier, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And then no temptation has overtaken you such as is common to man. So in that discussion about God providing the way of escape, that door, do not be deceived even into taking another door. And do not be deceived into thinking that God provides no door. He's the one that tempts. He offers no way out. Is this a tyrant God? No. He is not the source of temptation, but He is rather the source of our salvation, and He is the source of a path away from sin as we are saved through it in Christ Jesus. And so what is God the source of? He is the source of goodness. We've already noted back in verse 5 and even uh, down through there that God is in the business of gift giving, isn't He? He wants to give these things. He gives us wisdom in verse 5. And then, uh, well, I'll note the the first usage uh, of verse 17, every good gift. So that first word for gift, this is actually the idea of Uh, the act of giving, the actual act of giving, uh, which is continual. It's continually being given. And then the second usage of it there, uh, every good gift, that's the first, and every perfect gift is from above. So this is a gift which has already been given. It's already been given. Uh, In Matthew chapter 7, again, ask and it will be given, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. And then that discussion about uh, the evil giving good gifts and Heavenly Father giving even even better gifts and Him knowing how to give good gifts. And then that idea of a good gift. So this is a continual gift that's being given back in the very beginning of verse 17. But it's also good. So this is a gift that carries with it the idea of Uh, it benefiting the recipient. Always benefiting the recipient. Any gift that God gives, every good gift, we benefit from. We are, uh, or, or it is favorable to us. And then perfect, that perfect gift. This is something that is mature and it's reached its Uh, its completeness, its full potential of being perfect. So a complete, a full-grown gift, the very best possible. That should sound like some familiar language we've already read in James, right? Back in verse 4, let patience have its perfect work. So this perfect gift, these perfect gifts, are given to those who have worked towards this perfection. 
But again, only in Christ. Only through God we can attain these things. Well, <clears throat> with all of that idea, or with all of those ideas, God is giving these gifts, and so He is like a father in many ways, isn't He? Uh, <clears throat> I don't, know, I don't know about your own fathers, but there have been times, I'll say this, most of the time my father has given me good gifts. But I think we've all been in that boat where every once in a while we get a gift from them and we just kind of, we're kind of puzzled, like what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this, I've never said I wanted this, I've never said... Uh, I've liked this sort of thing. What's the deal? And so maybe we ask, uh, we ask for cash instead the next time, just so we can get what we actually want and something we deem to be good. But I'll say this. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what we need, not what we want. Maybe it is what we want sometimes, but He always knows what we need. And He is always, He has always, been giving good gifts, and he will continue to do so. And he knows no other way. I'll offer that. He is the Father of lights, again, as 1 John chapter 1 tells us. God is light, in him is no darkness at all, at, at all. And every good thing, every good thing that we can think of, that we could conjure up, it can be traced back to God. Because He is light. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. He is good. He's also the type of Father that's not going to show favoritism. He's not partial. As Acts 10 and verse 34 says, God shows no partiality, but in every nation the one who fears Him and does righteousness is welcome to Him. So He does make distinctions between uh, those who would do His will and th those who would not. Matthew 7, 21-23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he does make no distinction with who he wants to come. He wants all to come to him, all to have salvation, as Acts 10 says there. And so he wants to give those good gifts to all. Well, with that, since he is the father of lights and he's always been in the, the business of good gift giving, he does not change. In the very last verse here, uh, uh, well, not the very last verse, but verse 17. There is no variation. So that word variation, it's the only time that it's used in, the, in, the, in Scripture. The only time that it's used in the New Testament. And then also that, uh, that phrase, shadow of turning, I thought this was interesting. This is not something, maybe, maybe I had uh, heard this, but maybe it just left my brain. This is literally in reference to uh, the revolution or the revolving nature of a heavenly body, whether that's the sun, whether that's the moon, whether that's a star, whatever it might be. But James says, God stays constant. He's constant. So God is like the sun in the fact that he is a light, he is a great light, but that's really where the imagery ends. Because then James says, there is no variation, there is no shadow of turning with God. And so James wants us to understand that God is not like any sort of light where there is constant change. There's revolving, the sun sets and it rises, the moon fades and uh, or waxes and wanes. God is not like that. He's not like a sort of light where it shines in a lot of the room, but there are shadows and there are dark places. He reaches every part. Uh, I'm reminded of in Joshua, in that great scene in Joshua 10, where the sun stays in the sky uh, to allow the, uh, God's people to win the victory that day. And that's just a, maybe even a glimpse of what God is like. There is no variation. There is no shadow of turning. Eventually, the sun went back to its, uh, to its normal rotation. But God does not change. Rulers change. Nations change. We change our clothes. People change. God is constant. There is no variation. And then finally, speaking of good gifts... 
and I don't think I put this one up on the screen, so those of you who are uh, note-taking, God gives new birth. So we've already looked at the, uh, the imagery of sin bringing forth death, which is literally the idea of sin giving birth to death. God brings forth or gives birth to what? He gives birth to us, to new creatures. We are the children of God. And, and you think about that. How can a father be a father if he has no children? And we are his children, those of us who are in Christ. And I would notice here as well, it's not as if we just stumbled into his house. It's not as if one day we just showed up at the door and said, oh yeah, I wasn't expecting you. Yeah, you're part of my house now. Verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth. Okay, what does his will look like? How does that happen? By the word of truth. So we can overcome temptation when we are reminded that we are children of God. When we are presented with temptation, we are to be reminded again that God is light in Him is no darkness at all. And God has given us His Word. And we come to know who He is through it. And when we come to know who He is, we understand what, uh, that He wants to be our Father, and then further, how we can become His children, and in fact, be good children. This is kind of a sneak preview of the next lesson in James, uh, in verse 21, uh, that implanted word that He talks about. So, we can overcome we can overcome. Just briefly, I'll, I'll note uh, one final thing here. That, that uh, word, first fruits, that should draw us back to uh, Leviticus and the old law where this, was, this is to be given to God and to God alone. This is a portion for God. It's holy, it's separate, it's reserved for God, it's the best. And so God does not accept the leftovers. God doesn't, uh, He doesn't accept... Uh, the second fruits, only the first. We are new creatures. We are born again. We are to put on the new self, that new man. And if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 17. So without being a child of God, and please listen to this, without being a child of God, it is impossible, impossible to overcome temptation. You're not alive if you're not in Christ, but you are dead. And the only way to have life is through Jesus Christ. And it's through His Word. It's through that implanted Word. But if you accept that word, that is to hear it, to come to believe it, and then to act on it in confession and true repentance and putting him on, putting Christ on in baptism, then you can begin that walk. And then you can begin to realize the joy that it is to take joy in trials, to overcome temptations. But again, that's only possible through God and through Jesus Christ. If you're here this evening and you're not in Christ, you can do that this very evening. If you've strayed from the path, you can come back, and we would be happy to help in any way that we can. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing the song that's been selected?